Can you tell us more about your story? I um, My marriage ended in 2019. Um, it was a shock to me. It was unexpected, um, no fault of my own. And my husband at the time and I both traveled for work. We had just gone through IVF procedures and had nine-month-old twins, very intentionally. So, um, you know, you just don't expect that your marriage would be ending after going through that much trauma to create a family. So um, I'm already like in shock over just the marriage ending and I am trying to protect my children. Um, during the pregnancy, his anger and violence got worse. His um, alcoholism was exposed and got worse. Um, I had, he had just recently gone to a therapist and was diagnosed with uh, severe depression and suicidal. I had written proof, you know, six, six times that he had threatened to kill either me or himself. Um, so there was so much evidence, so many pictures and just things that I felt like I was safe to go into the family court and they were going to protect me and the kids. And I was so wrong. Um, I felt like the minute I walked in, they had our case decided. Um, all of the decisions were made in the judge's chambers with the attorneys. Um, my ex, now ex-husband and I, in March of 2020, we had made an agreement for the custody of the children, um, visitation. He wanted to see the kids two four-day weekends a month because he had the same career I did, and we both traveled for work. Um, so we, we made the arrangements, we had it filed, signed, notarized, and ready to file in court. His attorney talked him out of it, even though he had already signed and notarized the parenting plan. He did not seek custody of the children until child support was mentioned. When they gave him a child support calculation, then he wanted custody of the children. And at that point, I was a bad mother. For all of us who practice as GALs, um, a lot of times we are not paid as much as other attorneys in domestic, and sometimes we are not given the respect as full attorneys, sort of, you know, we've all had that, like, I don't get an exhibit book, why, what, what, you know, or I sit in the jury box. But one of the things that we know is we all have each other's back. We found that uh, there are strength in numbers, and... Um, Hank was the one that suggested that we get together just like we did him and, and you know it was everybody as soon as the email was out from Hank and me it was yep 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 so that's what we are what we're doing Elaine as you know all of us here are supporting you 100% so this is to support you today but we're also um, we also want to do what we can collectively so there's technically five five defendants. I don't really know why they didn't sue my law firm, but they didn't. Um, so all five, all five have different defense lawyers. All five have filed motions to dismiss. And, and then there's also additional motions about protective orders. Um, are you serious today? Okay, I just got a note that maybe we're not having a tomorrow. The judge just recused himself.
I wonder if they're going to seek somebody from a different county since this, since they're arguing that this is a systemic thing. There is concern that licensed attorneys might be getting this information and feeding it. So that's something to take up with the court for one thing. Is it a lawyer? Is it somebody in the circuit clerk's office? And I'm not trying to be mean. It is um, more so than an attorney not on the case can get. So or paralegal. Somebody's paralegal may be getting it. Oh, that's true. I'm not trying right. I like my court book. I like the court book, so it's not anti them. Yeah. It's out of the box. Uh, the meeting is this afternoon that Judge Burton is calling, and I think that now that more judges are being called out and named, I'm sure it has gotten their attention, but this threatens to take down the entire system. The judges are in on it. Um, Someone attending that meeting this afternoon? Yeah, I am. Do you want to just bring it up as an issue that we see and making sure that Burton at least make sure that the domestic judges are aware of it? Yep. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure everybody has some pros and cons about Jim Reed. I mean, there's, but he's one of the substantial ones. And if he's knocked out or if he says, like Elaine does and like Jen's getting ready to do, I don't want to do this anymore. It's not worth it. Then we're on. Step one. A petition for dissolution or petition for declaration of paternity or child support is filed. If both parties agree, assets are split, child support is determined, and you're done. If there is a disagreement on custody, your family is moved on to the next step. Step two, all attorneys, professionals, and judges agree to fight. At this point, a system engages. A guardian ad litem is appointed. Financial disclosures determine the amount of fees the court can order. There is a behind-the-scenes assessment of which parent is the aggressor. Excessive discovery begins against only one parent. Multiple actions will be taken by the court and labeled settlement conferences with increased billing each time. A complete loss of custody is threatened due to an adverse recommendation by the guardian ad litem. This eventually leads to a settlement. Elaine has um, an expert. She has identified an expert. I don't know who this person is. I don't want to know. But they think that they might be able to uncover this. These people cost $425 an hour. Well, can I ask, is the expert uh, a, a computer forensics expert trying to track down, you know, who's doing this and where this is coming from? I mean, that's what I would, I, I was going to suggest that. Yeah. We need to be, we need to be in this with you, Elaine, because well, it, it affects all of us. Well, and also there's, it's self-serving, Elaine, if you want to just like make yourself feel better about it, it's self-serving. <laughs> You're just the first, I mean. Well, we've all been hit with problems. Some of us have had to file even orders of protection against people. I mean, it's, you know, it's it's the nature of the beast. But this is at a level unprecedented. And, um, y you know, once they take you down, then we're all next. The man, Dan, you know, it's interesting because uh, I, a couple of these lawsuits are with women, mad women. Who's the treasurer, Sarah? I'll, I'll be happy to be treasurer. I, I prefer I check. prefer a check and prefer like a paper trail if possible. And do you think it are you going your IOLTA account, Greg? Yeah, I think it should be a separate bank account. I hate to say, I think okay. it needs to go on your IOLTA because if this is going to be an ongoing thing, would you want to say GAL committee? Yeah, I think that makes I sense. There's too much. If there's more money than Elaine needs then then Greg would have to go through, figure it all out. Who gets to get a return of their funds? But if you do the GAL fund, then if for other events, we could use the money. So no, when you donate, you're not getting it back. Okay. Is that fair? Yeah, <laughs> you could come up with like an informal name, like maybe the GAL team fund or something that everyone puts in the memo line. That way Greg is very clear 
And then at the end of the lawsuit, when all this is behind us, if there's money left over, we can save it for something else, or we can all collectively decide to donate it somewhere, or we can kind of look and see what the situation is then. Or a happy hour. Yeah, we have, a, we have a victory party. Uh -huh. When did the red flag start to go up for you guys in your case? The red flag was day one when I walked in there and um, my son's father paid for us to fly a one-way flight to Missouri. Mm -hmm. Even though we lived in New York together, I had a job, I had responsibilities. She was, she was served with a writ of habeas corpus to uh, appear yes. in court in Missouri. Absolutely. Um, and told that if she didn't appear, they were going to come take her, handcuff her and bring her to Missouri. And that was by Kim Whittle. They put my son, my disabled son, in a closed courtroom with all the demons themselves in there. I was not allowed to be in there. His father was not allowed to be in there. And I have no idea what happened. The first day my son and I, Nico Guzmano and I, met with Kim Winnell. She came and picked me up in St. Charles and took my son and I to the Bob Evans, where I sat there at the, you know, when people go, waited to see, you know, I, and, I, and she's like, just stay right there. And then uh, Nico and I are going to go get a table. So I'm sitting there with a stack of papers for her and I to go through to protect my son's rights. Sure. Well, I sat there the whole time while they had breakfast. And I walked up to that lady and I said, first of all, I hope you serve my son with a gluten-free breakfast because he has celiac disease. You made me sit there while you interrogated my disabled son without his mother being present. You threatened me, you threatened my son, you are taking away his civil rights. All this happened and thank God I had money to go forward with it. But you can't go forward when it's all paid off. <laughs> you know, the Guzmano family was sitting with the Newells in my mother and father's apartment in Baldwin conducting this, this plan to take my son. My adopted family, as Franco mentioned on the stand. You had to throw that out because that's just more discrimination than stabbing the mother, right? It, it, it's, it's horrifying. My parents didn't talk to me. My daughter doesn't talk to me. My brother that lives in Baldwin. My daughter lives in High Ridge. They were all paid off flying monkeys. And there were a lot of them around. But my own family discredited me trying to protect my disabled son. First of all, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And that's where we're at right now. They have the absolute power. You can't fight them. I fight them. What, what if I go down to the courthouse, start screaming and holler on my lawyer or the judge, what happens? The cops come take me, stick me in jail. Just trying to stand up for my rights. You know, you can't. There Without everybody on the same page, you can't fight them. It's hard to get everybody on the same page. What message would you have for them to come out and support the victims? All you have to do is just listen to all of us. You see our pain. Listen and believe it. Listen it's and there. believe it that this is all true. This is, I know it doesn't seem like it because it's, it doesn't. It hasn't happened to you, but it could happen to you. Do you think that this has any impact on the what we originally started this group and talked about was because of the legislation about changing GAL standards and things like that? I just have a fear that if this continues, there's going to give even more traction to ratifying the, the GAL standards and things of that sort. And I just, you know, it's hard enough to do our jobs, but now, you know, now we got to, I don't know, I just feel some kind of way about it. I feel like the GAL standards is, you know, is a part of this whole thing. I think ultimately you certainly could be right. You know, I think when all this stuff started and yeah, that would again, give them a whole lot of fuel. I think this is a way to even go around that though and try to destroy, sort of destroy the system in another way. I'm here today to ask you to support me to save Missouri children 
from sexual abuse, suicide, emotional abuse, and mutilation. This is Michaela Haynes. She took her life after she was repeatedly sexually abused by her father in the custody of DFS and screaming to everyone, please help me. Everyone pretended nothing happened. Michaela, to save her little sister Sarah, took her life. Michaela's guardian at Lydum was representing the deviant convicted child pedophile who molested Michaela's oldest sister, Michaela's second sister, Melissa, and then he molested Michaela herself. And now there is one child left, and guess what? She is going to be molested unless we do something about it. There is no reason this person needs immunity. We need to protect our children and not enrich those who represent them. I drafted a law that removes immunity from guardians at litem. There is no reason why a Missouri licensed attorney should not be held accountable for the way that attorney represents a child. I need all the help I can get for this case. I was actually curious, are people considering stopping GL work? I mean, I know some people probably aren't in a position to do that. I've certainly considered it. I haven't because I'm very seriously considering it. On Instagram or something, you know? I don't have any other, I don't have any other kind of business. But no, I, I understand. I just, I was, I was just wondering if, I was just wondering if that crossed anybody else's mind. Yeah, it crossed Jen's mind. I don't, I gotta go to the other screen. I don't know if it crossed anybody else's mind. Yes, yeah, it's crossed almost everybody's mind. Right. I don't want to give into it. You know, for a lot of us, I don't think we want to give into that the same way when we used to talk about for a while when attorneys were trying to DQ us all the time. Um, you know, you don't want to give into that. And, and I don't, wouldn't think, you know, any of us really want to give into it. But if it gets bad enough, yeah, I, I think probably, I, I can't imagine it hasn't crossed almost everybody's mind that's in this room. Yeah, you gotta get better stars, nothing but less get up.